previous video I did on the Commodore 65, a rare prototype of a Commodore 64 successor, I had mentioned the Mega 65, which is a modern recreation of that. I also mentioned that I'd never been able to acquire one for a video. And so I'd like to introduce you to Dan. He's part of the actual Mega 65 team, and he flew all the way from Seattle to show me a Mega 65. Yeah, uh, I heard you didn't get a chance to play with one yet, so I thought I'd bring one down. I don't, sorry, I don't have an extra one. This is my own personal Mega 65, but I thought I'd bring it down to show you. Okay, so let's go ahead and get something out of the way, because I'm sure a lot of people are going to be asking about this. They're going to say, well, David, don't you have this Commander X-16? Isn't this going to be a competing product? Why would I do a review of this? And uh, I would just like to point out that over the last several years, I've done a number of reviews on what could be considered competing products, such as the, the little mini like C64s and the Amigas and stuff like that. I've done the Gigatron. I've done the Mini Pet. And uh, oh, and I've got another one I'm going to be doing here eventually, the Aquarius Plus. So, yep, I got one of those on hand, too. I just happen to like all these systems. I think that they're pretty cool, and I think my viewers like to see them. So having said that, um, I think that we are going to do some comparisons between the Mega 65 and the Commander X-16 later, just so people can kind of see what does make them different. But I also think that they're similar enough that we're hoping to see some software synergy between these. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are similar architectures, similar CPUs in a lot of cases, uh, similar graphics capabilities, sound capabilities. Uh, even though they are very different in, in some cases in interesting ways, uh, there uh, is a lot of potential for a single investment in a like a game project or something like that to benefit all of these platforms by reusing the game assets and even some of the game logic. Yeah, uh, if you've ever heard that term, the rising tide lifts all boats, it, we kind of feel like that applies to uh, to these retro computers. The Phoenix Project could be included in that as well. Absolutely. Okay, so let's do a quick comparison. At the hardware level, the Mega 65 is essentially powered entirely by an FPGA, whereas the Commander X16 runs on discrete DIP package chips, more similar to computers from the past. I'm not necessarily saying one design is better than the other. At this point, it's just a different way of doing things, and each concept appeals to different groups of people. So, CPU-wise, the Mega 65 has a 16-bit CPU running at 40 MHz, which is backwards compatible with the CPU in the X16, which is an 8 MHz 6502. Then there's the 8 megabytes versus 2 megabytes of RAM. Uh, both machines have very nice graphic systems that can display 4096 unique colors. Uh, each one has their pros and cons of how they work. The Mega 65 has 12 channels of SID sound, or like having four SID chips. Uh, the X16 has a combination of FM and PSG channels. Both systems have a stereo DAC for sound effects. Also, both systems use an SD card for primary storage, and both systems run a variant of Commodore BASIC. So, as you can see, they have more in common than you might think. And one big difference is the price. The Mega 65 currently sells for 666 euros, which at the time of filming roughly translates to 740 US dollars, and the X16 sells for 350 US dollars. And there are certainly reasons why the Mega 65 is more expensive, so let's take a look. Uh, the first thing you'll notice about the Mega 65 is, of course, the case. It's a very nice injection molded plastic case, which is almost identical to the Commodore 65. The keys themselves are also very nice and use mechanical switches, which feel great to type on. On the rear, you get audio output here. The next slot is for one of these tiny micro SD cards that slides in there. Next, you have Ethernet, HDMI compatible video, VGA, a standard Commodore disk drive port, a cartridge port, and the power port. On the side, we have power, two joystick ports, and a reset button. The rest of the port areas on the side are blank, and you'll see why shortly, but uh, I just wanted to point out that this uh, USB jack is not standard. This was added by Dan, and this is for external reprogramming of the computer. And check out this spiral bound user manual. This is something I'm quite jealous of that uh, we don't yet have for the X16. This is really nice and it definitely has the look and feel of the Commodore 64 manual. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and plug this thing in and I'm gonna use a VGA monitor, but uh, since the Mega 65 outputs HDMI compatible video simultaneously, we're gonna plug that into a capture device so we can get good recordings of what we're working on. Okay, so I need to explain something about HDMI video. So you may or may not have noticed that I was saying HDMI compatible video. And the reason for that is, technically speaking, in order to have HDMI video, you have to pay a license and you have to go through a bunch of red tape. And However, much like it's possible to create an IBM compatible computer, you can create an HDMI compatible video output. You simply can't use the HDMI logo or technically even call it HDMI video. And so let's power it on. 
Uh, you may notice the boot screen resembles the Commodore 65 boot screen, which is not a coincidence. The Mega 65 is running a version of the original Commodore ROM uh, code, the original Commodore kernel code for the Commodore 65. The Mega 65 team has made enhancements to the uh, ROM. We've uh, licensed it from Cloanto so that we can uh, make some enhancements for the uh, Mega 65. Um, but so that otherwise should look pretty familiar. Uh, we can always uh, uh, type in basic programs and run them. Very familiar. This is running a version of BASIC that was originally based on the Commodore 128 BASIC, BASIC version 7. For the Commodore 65, they made some extensions and called it BASIC 10. For the Mega 65, we have also made a few enhancements, and so we're calling it BASIC 65. So just to be clear, the Commodore 65 and the Mega 65 are not exactly equal. Uh, the Mega 65 hopes to be backwards compatible with the C65, but it is in fact uh, more advanced in nearly every way. So one unfortunate side effect of this is that software created for the Mega 65, generally speaking, is not compatible with the original Commodore 65 prototypes. So for the dozen or so people out there who actually have and use uh, working uh, C65 prototypes, uh, there's not much software out there for those machines. And unfortunately, they're not getting any new software out of this deal. One bit of software that Dan wanted to try was the Kaleidoscope program I had written in BASIC. So I put the program on a disk and we tried it out and sure enough it worked. Of course uh, here it's running at 40 megahertz, but uh, you can set the clock speed all the way down to 1 megahertz. so here's that. And then here's 3.5 megahertz, which is the original speed of the C65. So one interesting comparison is that this program runs as fast, if not faster, on the Commander X16, despite the fact that the Mega 65 is uh, at least five times as fast. And so Dan and I talked about that a lot, and I think we both came to the agreement that uh, there's, there's really two issues. One is just the implementation of BASIC is probably a little bit slower. But probably the bigger deal is that the C65 uses planar graphics, much like the Amiga, which is slower to plot pixels than the type of graphics system that we're using. And so um, now they have added some other types of graphics systems to the Mega 65 that the C65 didn't have, and that should alleviate a lot of that. But make no mistake, any program that's written in assembly language is going to run way faster on the Mega 65. So let's have a look at some software written just for the Mega 65. Uh, Dan connected up a gamepad and showed me some examples. This little boat game is interesting. Uh, it's basically like Flappy Bird, but in the water instead. Now this is a bit more impressive. It's called the Great Mega Sisters. For those that don't get it, it's based on the Great Gianna Sisters, which was a popular side-scroller game on the C64. And while it has a lot of graphical similarities to Gianna Sisters, the behavior of the main character is quite different. Still, um, this is a good showcase for the system, I think. This is a nice, mouse-controlled solitaire game. It runs in high-res graphics and looks great. Oh, and uh, this is pretty interesting. Um, it's called Battle Sparrow. Uh, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it uses Petsky graphics, showing that people still love Petsky graphics even in 2023. But more interesting is that it was actually written in BASIC, and I think that's great because uh, one of the goals of these retro systems is to give us enough actual speed so that uh, BASIC can actually be used to make games and be fun to program in. Here's an interesting puzzle game with uh, some great looking graphics. And here's a game called First Shot. Uh, this one is really impressive from a graphics and sound perspective. Uh, definitely looks like something from the late 16-bit era. And here's another puzzle game. It's one of those match three type games. And here's one called Unicone, I think, and it's quite interesting. <laughs> I think the unicorn is possibly pooping out ice cream and you have to catch it. And there are some uh, text adventures like this one called Hibernated One. And here's an unfinished game, which is really just a proof of concept game engine for Turrican. Um, it has no sound and really no functional gameplay. Um, apparently this will not be finished as the author was not able to secure copyright clearance. And the last one I'll show you is a little western game called Showdown. And there are a number of demos on the system too, like this one. Or this one. Okay, so those were all native Mega 65 games and demos. Um, however, there are some larger libraries of software out there uh, that you can run on the machine. Uh, because the Commodore 65 had a C64 mode, and so does the Mega 65. 
So you can just type go 64 and bam, you're in 64 mode. But if you remember my video on the C65, I pointed out some issues that made it not 100% compatible. So you can still play a number of games this way, and here it is playing Petsky Robots, which is no surprise because we already knew the C65 could do this. Um, since the Mega 65 has a cartridge port, I thought I'd also try that. I have a wall of cartridge games, but uh, what we need is a Commodore 64 cartridge game. So I'm going to be honest, there weren't really a lot of great uh, cartridges for the C64. Um, so I'm not really sure. Like, I don't know. This would probably be a good one here. So we found the cartridge games worked, but they had some weird glitches like uh, Avenger runs kind of slow and Gorf always starts at the second level instead of the first one for some reason. But uh, keep in mind, these are running in the C64 compatibility mode of the Mega 65. However, because the Mega 65 is based on FPGA technology, it can transform into a completely different system simply by loading a new core, much like a mister would do. You can select a core on boot up by simply holding down the no scroll key while powering on the system. And one of the cores that's available for the system is a Commodore 64 core. Now using this core, it should be darn near 100% compatible. So when running this core, not only can you run Petsky Robots, but you can run the REU version, which has much improved graphics. And that also means you can run other REU games like Sonic the Hedgehog or Sam's Journey. Now, one of the other cores it has, which seems almost like heresy, is the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Uh, and it even has an arcade machine core, which is Galaga. And as you can see, uh, this is ported from the Mr. Core. So what this core is simulating is the actual board that was uh, in the Galaga cabinet, as well as the original ROM codes. So needless to say, this should be very authentic. Of course, backwards compatibility can be a double-edged sword. I mean, obviously there's the benefit of the larger upfront software library, but it could come at the cost of discouraging native software development. Historically, we've seen cases where it wasn't a problem, such as the Nintendo Game Boy Color. Uh, the old black and white games still played fine, but a lot of new stuff emerged for the color systems. Also, the Apple IIGS had a fairly healthy native software market. But then uh, look at the Commodore 128. Uh, those were doomed to spend most of their lives playing C64 games. Now, one more thing I'd like to mention is that the Mega 65 also has a basic IDE, which is very similar to what we've developed on the X16 platform. It allows you to write basic code without line numbers in a much more structured and readable way using a text editor, um, and then compile or tokenize it over to regular basic code. And it seems to work pretty well. And now I think it's time to take it apart. And the first thing that took me by surprise is how small the board is relative to the case. This little board and cable here is a fix for older motherboards not needed on the current ones. And the other cable is the JTAG add-on used by developers. And then I noticed this extra SD card slot. So we have uh, uh, actually have two SD card slots on the thing. Um, the external one overrides the internal one. So you could just go without the external one and pretend like it's a magical... Uh, uh, the, the ROM is actually a file on the SD card, so you can pretend that this is a ROM chip as if it were inside here, um, and you can put disk images and stuff on this SD card. And of course, here's the floppy drive, which is just a standard PC floppy drive. And uh, these are not new since nobody makes them anymore, but apparently they found a pretty good stash of them for now to keep production going. Anyway, so that about wraps it up for the Mega 65. There's really a lot more material I could have gone into. I could have easily made a two-hour video about this machine and still not covered every aspect of it. Um, I also want to give a big thanks out to Dan for bringing it by so that uh, I could uh, get my hands on one and do a proper video on it. Um, anyway, as always, uh, thanks for watching.